We are on part seven, is it seven for you? Part seven of a series entitled Armed and Dangerous. In this particular part, which is part two of this three-part series, and it's part number seven of the three-part series, if you're confused, congratulations, maybe you're a little more confused, but we're dealing with deception. There's a, a lot of different doctrines and dogmas and deceptions out there, and they are coming in a lot of different, from a lot of different ways and a lot of different perspectives. And it's incredibly important that we fortify ourselves against this deception. The Bible talks over and over. Uh, Jesus himself talks about great deception that would, that would come in the last days. And, and you may say, well, whether it's the last days or not is, is somewhat subjective. And, and I agree, it is somewhat subjective. But he gave us certain things to look out for. He told us that there would be an abundance of false teachers. In fact, he warned, he warned his protege, Timothy, that there would come a time when people would really seek out people to tell them the things that they wanted to hear in order to validate the lives that they were living, even if those lives were in stark opposition to what the Word of God and God Himself stood against. And I think we're seeing that in an unprecedented uh, level or to an unprecedented degree here in America. I can't speak for what's going on in a lot of other parts of the world, but here we're seeing this. We're seeing that people are not only desirous to turn against God, but they want people to tell them that it's okay. And that's not just outside the church. That can be within the church as well. So a couple of Wednesday nights ago, uh, we talked, it may have been last Wednesday, we talked about some common objections to God. And some from a moral perspective and some from a, a, an existence perspective. I'm going to hit some of those again. Some of you are here. Some of you may have heard some of these. We may have covered some of these. Some of these are new. We did not cover them. So I want to arm you with some of those things. And then I want to, I want to make a hard shift into preparing you to recognize deception in the future and moving forward through the lens of the character of God. So let's jump into some of the common objections to God. One is the problem of evil, and here's the argument. If God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, why does evil exist? The presence of suffering and evil in the world is often cited as inconsistent with the concept of a benevolent and omnipotent deity. You've probably heard this. Maybe many of you, many of you actually struggled through answering this question. I think it's an incredibly important question to answer, but I think it's pretty simple. And I, I don't, I don't want to trivialize this because it is a very serious issue and it's a very serious question. But I think that I can sum it up very succinctly by saying God gave Adam real authority and he relinquished that real authority and there were real consequences as a result of that. See, if, if God is truly sovereign, then God can grant power and authority to whoever, whomever he desires. And that's exactly what he said. He said, I'm going to put you here to rule over creation in my stead. Man created in essence, or man, man perpetuated high treason or rebellion against God, which had real consequences. This is not some virtual fake thing that we're living God gave man real opportunity and real responsibility, and as a result of that, there are real consequences to our behavior. I'm going to touch on this in a few moments. People who ask this question often leave out the element of humanity. God can be all good. He can be uh, omnipotent. He can be all powerful. It doesn't mean that he won't deal with all of the evil. And that's part of what we herald in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the day is coming when all of the evil, evil and the perversion and the destruction and the wickedness that is caused by sin will be judged. Christ is the escape, the opportunity, the mercy, the expression of mercy to God, from God to humanity to escape the judgment that we all deserve. There will be a real reckoning for real rebellion. The question is this, where will you be on that day? Second one, scientific explanations. If you missed part one in this particular series, uh, you know, God and science and some of the other things that we were looking at, here's the argument that naturalistic expl explanations of the universe's origin 
the Big Bang Theory evolution provide no empirical evidence or necessity for a divine creator. Now, as we talked about before, science offers a description of, not an explanation of, things. When you look at, at, at gravity, when you look at the natural laws, they are descriptions of things that are, not explanations of why those things are or how they came about. When we talk about the Big Bang and we talk about the theory of evolution, they are just that. They are theories. And people will argue that. But as science grows and explanations and, and, and knowledge is increased, those theories are becoming obviously and, and evidently inferior to reality. There are no material answers provided for many of the greatest issues <clears throat> of humanity. None whatsoever. And you say, what are those greatest issues? Origin, morality, purpose, and destiny. There are no material answers for those questions. Even the questions themselves that are real to every single person sitting in here, those questions themselves are non-material. So when we try to relegate everything to materialism, we run into some huge problems from the onset. Science offers information and people extrapolate theory from the data. Data changes and as a result, theories change, but often at a much slower rate than the data. When a, a culture or a people or scientists or worldviews are adopted, it's really hard to change those, and we've talked about that in, in detail over, over time. People will believe something regardless of what science or, or one aspect or, or biology or morality or the Bible says. Very often that thing that we learn and we, we cement in our thinking, we are so reluctant to change. That's not just true in the scientific world. It's also true in the church. It's also true in, cre in Christianity. We're going to come back to that in just a few moments. Conflicting religions, and here's the argument. The existence of numerous religions with conflicting doctrines about God suggests that human understanding of God is culturally constructed rather than based on divine truth. This is one that uh, I have heard often, um, and exactly the, the problem, this is exactly what the real problem is if you kind of think about it. Cultural Reconstruction of God leads to deception concerning God. So in one essence, the, the, the question or the accusation is absolutely right. Now, can somebody be wrong? Absolutely. Is there right and wrong? Are there, are there right and wrong answers to math problems? Yes. Are there right and wrong answers to moral problems? Yes. Are there right and wrong answers to origin issues? Absolutely. And we should come to the, the right conclusion, not just a conclusion, to make everybody, anybody, everybody happy. Now, the failed logic, however, is that this in no way is an indicator that the divine truth doesn't exist. Just because a lot of people get it wrong or find or come to different conclusions doesn't in any way, shape, or form negate the existence of truth, especially when it comes to divine truth. Many of you know people who've been wrong. In fact, many of us have been wrong about a lot of things, but it in no way said or affected the truth or changed the truth. Very often it just changes our perspective. Man has always tended to, re to reject truth anytime it's contrary to culture. Think about it. How hard is it for us to go against the flow? Yet within the context of many cultures, he, even here in America, we see that when divine truth comes, it empowers people to go in a different direction. The truth here, is, as we see in, in a growing capacity in America, is one of humanism, one of materialism, one of, of, uh, of many different humanistic things that are affecting how people think, yet the truth of God comes in and floods people's hearts and floods people's minds, and they are able to change. They are able to, to look and say, well, how I've been living is not okay. It's not right. It's inconsistent with truth as experienced in reality and make those changes. That's why it's important that every nation and every culture hear the gospel. So the idea that there are conflicting religions, and that's a, a reason to believe there's no divine truth, again, there's, there's some serious failed logic there to begin with. Uh, the problem of hell. 
argument, the concept of hell as an eternal punishment for disbelief or sin is morally incompatible with the idea of a loving and just God. Is it really? So is justice incompatible with the idea of a loving and just God. It's complementary. In fact, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be loving and just without judgment. Something has to be done with the angels that rebel and humanity which is made in the image of God. They just can't be turned loose in eternity. There has to be containment. Now, I know from a very finite perspective, we don't consider things like this. But the truth of it is, everybody in this room is made in the image of God and will eternally exist somewhere in that capacity. Whether you're evil in essence or good in essence makes a huge difference. God can't just turn wicked humanity loose into eternity to run roughshod. Talk about releasing terrorists. <clears throat> he would not be loving or just if wickedness was not punished. Our ignorance of the destructive nature of sinful behavior is evidence to how far we've fallen. But I want you to consider this. Think about it. Every, every horrible thing, every horrible accusation that, that people make about God and, and about the existence of hell and judgment when it comes to bad stuff. Think, think about it for just a moment. All of the horrible things that people use as an argument against the existence of a loving God are the effects of sin that results in the eternal justice which they turn and condemn. Did you hear that? The very things they say, there can't be a God who, who exists because there is evil, turn again and say, there can't be a God that's truly loving and caring because he punishes evil, which is the result of that, that sin or that rebellion. Uh, you know, I, hear, I say this to people all the time. You understand, God doesn't tell you not to sin because he doesn't want you to have any fun. There is a destructive element to sin in our lives and in the lives of those around us. War. And, and, and famine, and a lot of times the, the, the egregious things that we see, the crimes that are committed, they're all motivated from the sin of selfishness, which is doing things our way as opposed to doing things God's way. And then we turn, as the proverb says, we live a life that is contrary to God and then blame God for the consequences. That's what humanity does. And, and why? In an attempt to alleviate our conscience from accountability. Divine hiddenness, and this is the argument. If God exists, why isn't God's presence more obvious? The hiddenness of God is puzzling if God desires a relationship with humans. You ever heard anybody say that? Hey, look, if God is real, he can just show himself to me, and if he shows himself to me, I would believe him. I would fall down on, on my face, and I would worship him. And we know that's not true. God revealed himself several times historically to humanity, and that generally was not the corporate response of humanity. In fact, when God showed himself to humanity on Mount Sinai, humanity said, no, we're going the other way. Moses, you go deal with this guy. We can't, we can't deal with him. We don't, we don't want anything to do with him. You know, I want you to think about this. Even the Israelites who saw the power of God and were delivered from Egypt, do you know what they did throughout the totality of their 40 years in the, in the wilderness? They worshiped false gods. They created false idols. They worshipped the starry hosts or the heavenly hosts as it's described. Think about that. They saw the majesty and the glory and the revelation of God himself, yet their, their wicked hearts said, we don't want that. That is one of the major problems with humanity. Christ was not hidden. He was and is on full display. People rejected him then, attributing his power to what? To sorcery and to the devil himself. And times haven't changed very much, have they? Our existence is evidence enough, according to the book of Romans, because of the ability of reason that we have been given to condemn us for rejecting God and the reality of God. Creation logically re requires a creator. And we've been given the ability to reason made in the image of God. Rejection of truth always, always leads to foolish speculation. 
we had a we were talking one Wednesday, and we were talking about the the idea of rejecting a potential truth or project rejecting a truth in our lives leaves a void. Something is always going to fill that void. And biblically we understand that it is generally something that's not true that fills that that void that is left when we reject truth and it becomes detrimental in reality. Now there are a lot of false teachings about Jesus held by a lot of different religions. Every major religion does something with Jesus. Okay, they come to a conclusion other than what and who he said he was. That is the problem with other religions. Other religions were so compelled that the historical Christ was a reality and what he did was amazing. They didn't argue other, over whether or not Christ was doing miracles. They argued over the source of his power. Think about that. Now, our theologians today and our historians, they look and they go, well, you know, these miracles were just things that they made up. Well, let me just explain this. The people who were there didn't believe that. The generations that followed didn't believe that. Other religions didn't believe that. Even the Jewish people who held every accusation against Christ being the Christ, they never said he didn't do the miracles as were described in the Bible. You know what they said? They said he did it through a nefarious power. You remember the story, and Jesus made it very clear. He said, okay, you say that I cast out devils through the prince of the devils. Well, who do your sons cast them out by? Because we claim the same father is what he was saying. It's, 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 it's a real Christ who was not hiding himself, who has revealed him, himself to humanity, and humanity has said we prefer darkness over light. That is the rebellion from which we're called to repent to avoid the judgment. Now, common false teachings about, about Jesus. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I am kind of, but I'm not trying to pick on any particular one. It's just there's a very prevalent uh, ideology concerning the person of Jesus Christ. If you'll remember on the first part of this series two weeks ago, we talked about the evangelical church and their per perception of who Christ was. Many thought that Jesus was the first and greatest of creation. And, there, and that becomes very, very problematic. Um, many people will call Jesus the Son of God, but when they use that terminology, they mean something very, very different than the Christian context. So I'm going to take what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, and there's what's called, there's, there, there's, um, when we look at different religions, this is a sect within Christianity. I want to address this because they hold a particular view concerning Christ that is consistent with a lot of the deception in the church and other religions. So there's a commonality, and that's why I'm doing this, so I'm not necessarily picking on them. But they believe that Jesus is God's son, but not God. A rejection of either the humanity or divinity of Jesus is something that is actually very common, and it is very subtle. Guys, this is where you really need to be armed. You really need to understand what you're dealing with. Jesus is God's son, but he is not God. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but they strongly reject the doctrine of the Trinity. They do not believe that Jesus is Almighty God or equal to the Father. Okay, I'm going to move on and give you some, some other information, and then we're going to come, then I'm going to show you some things. They believe that Jesus is a created being, the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God. And as, as we learned, again, many people believe this. Many people ascribe to this. Why? Why do people, and I want you to ask yourself, what do you believe about Jesus? Because we understand that Jesus and what we do with him is the number one thing. It's, 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 in fact, the greatest thing, because all of your hope is in him. You don't want to get this wrong. You want to get this right. Christ said, in the last days, many will come and say, I am the Christ, and they will deceive a lot of, a lot of people. How about this one? Jesus existed in heaven before his earthly life as Michael the archangel. Again, this is what they believe. Uh, they believe and they teach that he is the word referred to in John 1.1, 1, 1, and again, that he was God's first creation. According to their belief, Michael was used by God to create all other things, but is not co-eternal or co-equal with God. So they believe that Jesus existed before his manifestation here on the earth, 
but he existed as an angel, the archangel Michael. Now, something that you should know, Jehovah's Witnesses were not the first to come up with this, and many folks have been tripped up by this, and we really need to talk about it. There was a man named Arius, and what I want to nail down for you is the first time, the first formal challenge to the doctrine of Christ's divinity, when it happened, and what that kind of looks like, and why it's it's such an important issue. Arius, who, who lived from 256 to 336 AD, was the first formal challenger to the deity of Christ, but that was not until almost 300 years after the crucifixion. The deity of Christ, the godness of Christ, was a given, according to the church, church fathers. It was, it was something that, because of what John wrote, I heard, I heard one historian say, well, John, when he said in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the, the Word became flesh and dwelt among men, he couldn't have been talking about the deity of Christ, because the deity of Christ didn't come along until 300 years later. Well, here's a problem. The deity of Christ was being written about by John, who was face down on the boat worshiping Christ when he got through calming the storm. You remember that? So, you, it's, so the idea of Christ being God when they said, what manner of man is this? This is not something that was new. In fact, John was laying it out very clearly and very succinctly. Christ was worshiped as God in the flesh throughout church history to that point. As we noted a few weeks back, this was even acknowledged by the extra biblical writers. They said that there's a group of Christians and they come, or this group, this sect, and they come and they worship this man as God, singing hymns, meeting on the first day of the week, and then going away to share a meager meal, a meager meal. So that was the communion meal, and it was written by somebody who, again, was kind of observing from the outside. Now, Arianism taught that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was created by God the Father and therefore was not co-equal with the Father. This was the Council of Nicaea in 325. They convened this council to settle this issue because he was teaching something contrary to unsettle the issue. Again, over 300 years after the crucifixion. The council, and you need to understand this, the council ultimately rejected Arius' teaching and affirmed the deity of Christ. Why? Why would they do that? Was this something that, that somebody twisted and turned at an early age and, and made Christ and we've all been duped ever since? No, we're, we're going we're to talk about what their conclusion was and how they came and why they came to that conclusion. Again, the council ultimately rejected Arius' teaching and affirming the deity of Christ, stating that he was of the same essence of the Father. And there's a word in there that gives that is for that. But this affirmation was encapsulated in the Nicene Creed, which became a foundational statement of Christian orthodoxy, which would guide the church right up until where we are right now. So this was an issue, an accusation that came 300 years after the crucifixion of Christ that was settled then and has remained settled now, or we thought was settled now. But you see, it's nothing new. So when Christian cults or other religions come to the same conclusion, it's okay. It's nothing that's new. Don't be shaken. The Nicene, Nicene Creed declared Jesus Christ as begotten, the only begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, and thus affirmed his deity and co-eternal existence with the Father. The word begotten is a compound word, and this is kind of why they came to this conclusion, meaning only soul or unique, a unique type, a unique class, one of a kind or only. They were saying, he didn't say he was the only son. He was the only begotten. And that compound word says he was unique and he was different because he was of the same essence of the Father. That's the deity aspect. He did partake of flesh, which gave him the commonality with humanity. But he never left the essence that was never detached from the essence of God. Now, let me read to you in a scripture that should settle this for everybody. It should be very simple. Philippians 2, 6, 11. I would encourage you, please write this down. This is speaking of Jesus. If you will get this, you will not be flipped up. 
get this and hang on to this. Are you ready? Who being in very nature God. That validates what was determined or the conclusion that, may, that was made by the Nicaeans then right there in that scripture. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. <laughs> This is what the scriptures say. So the scripture is validating the essence connection with Christ and the equality of Christ and the Father. Listen to this. And did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing and taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He's talking about Jesus. Yes, he coexisted as the Word in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, he existed before he was born on earth. But there is no indication whatsoever scripturally that he existed as Michael the archangel. We, We hear a reference to the angel of the Lord throughout the Old Testament, and that's what's called a Christophany. It's when Christ did appear before he was born throughout, and, and he dealt with people. And people would wonder, well, why can I see the angel of the Lord who they, they associated with the Son of God and not, not die? Because he was an aspect, or he he reveals an aspect of God. When Christ was here and he was born in the earth, you were able to see the attributes. Remember what he said. He says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Have you seen the fullness of the Father? No, you would be dead if God showed up in his glory. All evil, it says all darkness would flee away. Well, problem is we've got darkness and deception on the inside of us. It's inherent in our sin, in in our bodies. Paul said, if you do those things that you do know that you do not desire, it is no longer you who sin, but sin that is in your members. You're connected to the creation because of your humanity. There are two major problems that we run into very often, and one, and this is true of, and I shared this a couple of weeks ago, but this is true of atheists and it's true of Christians. One, either not knowing what the Bible says or knowing something that isn't true. And I will tell you, I am, I am not sure which one is the worst. I'm not sure which is most detrimental to, to the culture and to, uh, to us as believers. Is it, is it not knowing my people perish for lack of knowledge? Or is it being deceived and, and really believing something that's just not true? Because this is serious business. Because how you think is going to determine how you live. And when it comes to the person of Christ, this is huge. This is important. So the biblical lens of God's character, I want to give you some some rules of engagement when it comes to the text, when it comes to reading the Bible, because you're going to hear and you're probably hearing and have probably heard all kinds of crazy stuff. Let me give you some rules of engagement that I apply. Number one, what is the text saying? It is not subjective. It is not negotiable. When you write a letter to somebody, it is not subjective, it is not negotiable. You meant what you said, and you said what you meant. That's what happens when we do communication. That's called communication. It's called language. Listen, God said what he meant, and he meant what he said. Do foolish men twist it and turn it into something it's not? Absolutely. Peter said this about the writings of Paul, but he in no way insinuated that it was negotiable in any way, shape, or form, or that it was untrue. He just said unreal learn people twist it for their own purposes and their own uses. And that's what we see. Don't let smart people who use big words talk you out of very simple, obvious truths that are in the Word of God, okay? But what is it saying? It's not subjective. Number two, or ask this, ask, what is the context? Is it descriptive or is it instructive? Is it conditional? And is it universal? Did you hear that? When I read the Word of God, I want to ask these questions. What is the context of what he's saying? Is it descriptive or is it instructive? What happens is God is describing something that's horribly wrong, and people will say, well, you know what? God's validating that. No, he's not. He's telling us about that and often tells us the result of adopting that behavior. It's not instructive. So don't let people cherry pick you into into deception. Is it descriptive or instructive? Is it conditional? Whosoever believes, is that conditional? Absolutely it's conditional. If you hear the truth, do you have the option to reject the truth? 
If you hear sound teaching, do you have the option rather to reject it or receive it? God thought so. He said, all day long I have extended my hand. I've told you the truth, and you're a stiff-necked people, and you've rejected me. Therefore, judgment is coming because of that rejection. Is it subjective to our receiving it? Absolutely. Is it conditional? How about this one? Is it universal? Is he talking in the context about an isolated incident with a specific people? Or is it something that's universal and that you can, you can build a universal doctrine off of? Does it apply to everyone? Serious questions. The implication. How and to whom does it apply? Are there implications being placed upon surrounding texts or circumstances? What are the implications of the truth or the text that I'm looking at? What are the applications of it? How do I apply it to my life? Does it apply to me? What adjustments need to be made in my life, my thinking, my attitude, my behavior? How do I live the particular adjustment that the Word of God's calling me to make? So that's called repentance. How do I live out this repentance? You say, well, where do you get that from? John said, you go and you repent and then show fruit of your repentance. That was his expectation for the Pharisees. He said, you brood of vipers, you're coming here. Now I'm telling you to change, to change your minds and then show evidence of the change of your mind and your heart through your behavior. That was the expectation of John the Baptist concerning the Pharisees and the teachers of that day should be expectation of us in, as well. So let's look at some of the unchanging characteristics of God, and these will become the interpretive lens of God's Word, allowing us to develop and recognize healthy doctrine. A distorted view of God will always lead you to distorted doctrines or conclusions concerning Him. That is huge. If you don't know who and how he is, you will always come to erroneous conclusions. 1 John 4, 9 and 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Here's a problem. <laughs> when you look at love, you have to look at God's definition of love. What is love? Love, 1 Corinthians 13, gives us an exhaustive list of the attributes of love. That is our description of love. Not the cultural changes and the cultural definitions that are imposed upon us. Love now in our culture is tolerance. Love is loving you no matter what crazy thing you want to be or you want to do, even if, even if it's to your detriment. Love never rejoices at unrighteousness. Do, do you understand? So if you say you love somebody and you join them or validate their unrighteousness, you are not living a biblical love. I didn't make that up. This is 1 Corinthians 13. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only, that's that word we were looking at early, unique son into the world that we might live through him. God is love. God has demonstrated his love, and God expects us to recognize and show godly love. That's what that's telling us. This is huge. These are the characteristics of God. So when you see something contrary to those characteristics as described, as, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 13 that are consistent with God and His love throughout the Bible, you'll know that something's wrong. Psalms 50 and 6 says, And the heavens proclaim His righteousness, for He is a God of justice. So when you see hell, you understand. Hell was not created for humanity. If you're a human in hell, you're a trespasser because you've rejected the mercy of God, which has been extended to all humanity. Nobody, everybody in hell had an option or will have an option on the front end. God is righteous. Don't be fooled. God is not mocked. He is a God of justice. Psalms 116.5 says, The Lord is gracious, and He is righteous, and He is full of compassion. These attributes are huge, because when you hear a doctrine inconsistent with these attributes, it should raise a red flag very, very quickly. Not one of them, any, not all of them, any of them. So we see that God is righteous, God is just, God is gracious, and God is compassionate. Very often the accusations made against God are contrary to every one of those. Well, if God was loving, if God was righteous, all of these questions that people have are really often accusations against God and His character. That's the 
order of behavior of humanity. Psalms 1830. As for God, his way is perfect. That means every other way, guess what? It's not. I used to work with a guy and he would always say it. He would always say this. Well, you can do it that way. <laughs> his implication was you can do it that way. You just might not be happy with the result. <laughs> okay. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who takes who, who take refuge in him. You know, it was funny. I heard a, a theo, not a theologian, a, a historian, a uh, uh, a scholar of the Bible talk about nowhere does the word say that the word is not flawless. And I'm sure he's got some really really smart way of of making that not say what it says. I'm just telling you. Okay, uh, Psalms 68 and 20, he can argue with the psalmist. So, Psalm 68 and 20, our God is a God who saves from the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Anybody else got any other escape from death other than through the so sovereign Lord? I'd like to know it. People have been looking for it for a long time. So his ways are perfect, his words are flawless, and God is sovereign. Numbers 23, 19, God is not human that he should lie. He's not a human being that he should change his mind. This tells us God is wholly different in nature than humanity. He's wholly different in his nature than we are as humans. He is holy and he is right and he is just. We have, we have br very different, very broken tendencies if we're honest. How about this one, 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slow, slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And that is the very accusation. Everybody, and in fact, the Bible tells us that this is the accusation that they will be using at the end times against God. They will say, well, you've been saying he's coming back forever. Every time something happens, you Christians start going, hey, Jesus is coming back, and it's the end. End. That, that, you know, which they have or we have. Every time there's a world war, man, it's the end of the world and whoever started it's the Antichrist. Do your history. That's what the church has always said. That's because very often we, we get our doctrine kind of confused and we try to impose culture on it. That's not the way it works. It should impose its culture on us, but that's a different story. But anyway, he is patient, he is intentional, he is merciful, and he's often misunderstood. And that's what we're dealing with. How do we help that? What do we do with that? One, we understand him through his word, and we make sure that we know him through relationship. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who and how do you see God? Because the standard through which you know him will be the standard through which you share him which will be to the degree that salt and light and God and the truth of God is expressed in our culture. Stand if you're able. This is, this is important on a, on a lot of different levels. Everybody in here has an idea of God, who he is, and how he is. Everybody in here has an idea of how you will relate to him. In fact, I'm going to say this. Think about this for just a moment. Every one of you right now have an idea of what it will look like on Judgment Day concerning you. You, in your heart, know right now, your heart is telling you, if you stood before God at this very moment, if Jesus is the way and the truth and the life that he, that he said he was, and there is no other way, what is your relationship to him right now in this moment? Because where you are right now in this moment has weight of where and how you will spend eternity. You will exist somewhere forever. It's one thing to know about Christ. It's one thing to have good theology of Christ. But do you know Jesus? And more importantly, does he know you? Here's what I can tell you. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe, whoever would cast their hope, whoever would would reach for him and ask with an honest heart for the help and hope that only he could provide, he would save them. Where are you right now in this moment? Does your life and your mind agree with who the Bible says that Jesus is or have you rejected him? Have you said yes to what he has said that he alone provides or have you rejected it? I'm here to tell you this. You have the choice. You can accept and rely and grasp and run for everything that God has given you in the person of Jesus Christ or you can reject it. But there are consequences. I don't care what anybody tells you. Don't let some silver, silver-tongued silver orator talk you out of the reality. When Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, there is no way to the Father except through me. If you're not in Christ, you're in trouble. Christ offers us hope and help today. If you're at a place where you say, I don't know this Christ, I'm telling you, if you don't know him, you do not have eternal life. I'm telling you this because I love you and I care about you, and this is the most important thing that there is. If you don't know in your heart that you know him and he knows you, that can change today. If you will repent and cry out with all of your heart, God save me in the name of Jesus through the work of what he has done, he will hear and he will save you and he will create something that has never existed on the inside of you. Old things will pass away and everything will become new. His essence through the power of his spirit will be joined with yours and your very want to her. The very things that we love that are damnable become detestable. If you don't know him and you know that he doesn't know you and you want to change that today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Raise him high and don't be ashamed. of the living God. Father, you said no man comes to the Son. No man comes to the Father except through the Son, and no man comes to the Son except the Spirit of God draws them. Holy Spirit of the living God, I'm asking you right now, Father, in your mercy, draw those who are destined for hell at this moment to repent and to turn to you, to trust in your good character and your good nature and your love towards them. Please, Father, Draw us to a place of repentance. Draw us to a place where our hearts burn in love, appreciation, and adoration for you. Help us, God, not to be deceived, but to be the light and salt that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name.